Okay, so I'll introduce yourself um, as David Marsh, and uh, I'm not going to slide on me, but basically, uh, basic r quick background is engineering, heavy engineering plus physics, chemical engineering, big manufacturing plants, uh, work way up, and then through that got into process re-engineering. And, and, and did both for a while, and then switched completely career-wise and company-wise from heavy engineering into food and drink. And I've been with food and drink since. Uh, and it's been on manufacturing plus supply chain. Uh, now, this presentation is about sales and operations planning. And it's a question I've got is, is it, do we see this as transformation, or is this about continuous improvement? So, so I've got a quick question for you, which is, if, if you have sales in operations planning, raise your hand. Okay, that's cool. Steve? You don't. Uh, keep your hand up if it's working okay. Oh, oh yeah, still tough, still tough. Okay, because I I what I want to explore is, um, why is it working okay then? Uh, and I think most of you have, you know, what are the kind of success factors? Uh, I would have been really pleased if there are people that haven't done it at all, but why is it? And, and how do you keep that going? So it sounds like you may not be in the transformation area, you may be in the continuous improvement area, and we can explore that. Uh, I want to do th three things. So we, we're, I'm the last one between you and drinks at six, I think there's a five minutes. Uh, so I, I would intend to do what, 10 minutes on just sales and ops planning, 10 minutes on what are the complexities around it, uh, and 10 minutes on this uh, transformation or continuous improvement. I've got slides based on uh, my term with, uh, uh, with um, Nomad, Whitbread, Diageo, uh, Kerry, and I've worked also uh, with some assignments for uh, Pepsi, GSK, etc. So they're not, they're not branded slides. Originally, I intended when I agreed to do this, it was with somebody from Nomad Foods. Uh, but they've got some big changes under, underway for the better. Uh, and for business reasons, can't, we, we, could, we couldn't do it together. So it's not about one company. This is just about an overall position. Right? So, so the introduction here is, is around sales and operations planning. And it's been, around, it's been around for some time, like a lot of things in supply chain. They've been around for years and years. I've been working in supply chain now for must be 25 going on 30 years. Um, and I know there are new sort of um, like blockchain and uh, value chain, lots of kind of words around this. But actually, the fundamentals haven't really changed. The fundamentals have. Um, when you actually come to the use of technology and speed and flexibility and customer experience, then yes, yeah, sure, there are changes. But sales and operations planning, if you'd answered, well, we're not doing it, I would actually disagree with that. I think you must be, whoever you are, you must be trying to balance up what are we trying to move to customers, whether you're selling it uh, or giving it away, uh, with the capacity to supply that. And if it's down at the tactical level, it might not be formalized as sales and ops planning, but people are trying to do that all the time. Uh, so companies apply sales and ops planning strategically. So that's their annual operating plan, uh, business plans going forward. They call it uh, integrated business planning if you've progressed or joined up business planning, various sort of terms here. Um, external considerations are really around customers. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm basing this on my experiences as uh, manufacturing and supply chain manufacturing. Um, not, but you can still apply it to service. And when I say manufacturing, uh, so I did uh, 12 months with Whitbread, uh, and even in Whitbread in the restaurants, think about it, manufacturing, where does that happen? In the kitchen, in the restaurant. Yeah. So the supply chain still feeds through to the restaurant, but, but everything that applies to sales and ops planning, demand, supply, still, still can apply there. It just depends on where you think the, the uh, manufacturing position is. Uh, there are internal uh, challenges, which are around uh, flexibilities. 
going to move back here again. It's going to annoy. Uh, I'd change management. And I think that's one of the biggest factors I've seen in applying sales and ops planning. It is around that change, the culture. Uh, moving from I, I'm identified with this part of the com company, but actually I'm totally interdependent and integrated or should be with other parts as well. Um, and we all want to explore also SNOP as a relevant, uh, critical even, business capability. So recap, 10 minutes, um, challenges and complexities, discuss a bit, and then that transformation. So... I'm going to, there's about six slides here. Uh, this one's for the people that like lots of words. So this is, this is basically saying what's the definition of sales and ops planning. And the key words I've highlighted here are about decision making. So you're, you're equipping decision makers with the ability, with uh, current, past, future performance in order to make uh, decisions about your portfolio and your ability to actually uh, make, move, uh, and deliver, and sell. And, and the key thing about this is that it, it doesn't say this implicitly here, but it is about the demand side of the business, which is sales, marketing, new product, w with also the supply part of the business. I should say, if there's anything in here that you think, well, that's not quite right, shout out, and we can, we can discuss it. I've got some uh, slides that show sales and ops planning. So this next one says, okay, we're, we're, this is about the time horizon. So for me, the sales and ops planning is pitched at rolling months. It's not about what's going on day to day and in, the, uh, in that week, in that week, week, four weeks in the month. It's all about the kind of monthly, because it's really around the uh, annual operating plan. So we're not trying to fix um, problems with uh, the plant, the line not working, uh, or the fact that uh, the customers uh, ordered and or escalated an order. Uh, we're trying to get trends and look, f look uh, at the monthly, looking ahead to the annual operating plan and then beyond that in order to make decisions about have we got the right capacity, are, we, are the promotions actually working, uh, have we got the right product and the product portfolio, are we prioritising them right? In other words, is that end-to-end -end supply chain from suppliers all the way through to customers working for us? Snapshot. Right? And, and what about the implications and decisions that we need to make going forward? So that's... That's timelines. Another way to look at sales and ops planning is the demand cycle, the supply cycle, and the fact that we're looking to balance this. We never will actually balance it, but it's actually looking to see whether or not we've still got that capability to match what the demand is. Yeah? So uh, portfolio, new products coming in, uh, changes to new products, uh, sales, promotions, uh, promotions particularly is, are seen as a, um, uh, something that can adversely impact, but they need to be taken into account. And then on the supply side, it's about uh, manufacturing, capacity, use of capacity, use of resources across the, across the company with your uh, manufacturing capacity planning, uh, inventory planning, uh, and material requirements, all the way back to, to uh, your suppliers. And, and where the bubble is for sales and ops planning, what we're balancing there is, yes, the demand and the supply, but we're also matching that with, are we still in line with our, with our strategy? Is our annual operating plan still going to work? And what about the uh, next 12 months beyond that? Uh, and are we making the right trade-offs between, on the customer side, our customer service level, with our manufacturing capacity and the use of, and with the amount of stock that we're holding. Now, ultimately, this comes down to skew to skew to skew. But we're not looking to, to on a monthly basis, go everything, every single, through every single thing. We're looking to do it on an ex exception basis. So what's jumping out? You might bring it up to uh, product families. So rather than looking at a particular, and I'll call it out, fish, pack of fish fingers, we're looking at fish fingers overall, because we could probably have, what, 300 different products, but are all under that category of uh, fish fingers. Yeah? 
and all of those have the same or could have the same uh, source also, whether it's cod or whether it's pollock or whether, whatever it is. So month, monthly cycle, looking at the balance and picking up the annual operating plan. Very simplified trading model. Another way of looking at sales and ops planning is, uh, I've forgotten how to do the pointer on this, but uh, we're looking at customer orders coming in with a forecast, uh, market units, uh, so that's that demand coming in. Information flows are going from right to left. Physical flows are going from left to right. So, so in this, that demand there is actually going to directly impact the information that's driving the replenishment of stock in order to meet that customer demand. And is it, the, is it that button there? The biggest one. The biggest one. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. Oh, there we go. So one of, the, one of the things to consider here, which isn't part of sales and ops planning, but it is if we've got variable demand here, um, we need to position the markets and the stock at the markets and the capacity, whoops, and the capacity of our manufacturing and co-packers. Uh, we need to position that so we're not spreading that variation all the way down the uh, supply chain. So decoupling. Um, demand from supply and more collaboration and relying on the forecast and relying on the variability and, and also applying uh, um, product prioritization. So you know for your class A, fast moving, high volume, high margin, you'll have a different strategy at DC than you would for uh, slow moving, infrequent, high variability. Now all of these figure in net sales and not planning, but these are strategies that will underpin sales and operations planning. Uh, so that's your network optimization, your portfolio uh, prioritization. Again, it is though back to trade-offs. So it's back to the trade-offs between using your manufacturing. Uh, do you just want to do long runs for manufacture and then store the stock? Or, or do you know that the better strategy is to actually do shorter runs um, and have flow going through and, uh, and in, order to deter, uh, in order to meet your customer service level. So that's another view, which is a trading model. And the third one I want to show is the cycle itself, because this does, in, does involve different parts of the business. Uh, so it's about portfolio review, that's new products coming in, changes to products. Uh, and you could have it on a week two, three, four, one, two. Right, so there's a monthly cycle. It starts off with portfolio review. The next stage is about demand review, right? So that's agreeing what that snapshot is and then very quickly moving from snapshot of demand to can the supply actually uh, deliver that? So you're feeding through that other loop. Reconciliation, changes, optimization. And the third important one is your executive SNOP review. So of those... Is it, do those slides resonate with those that are using SNOP? Do you have an executive review? How is, how is it done? Is it done in market or do you have an overall company? Right, okay. And, and is that because of the model that your company operates at? Is Okay, okay, so that's worked. And I guess that's why it works then, because the exec will want it to work. And, yeah. and do you have quarterly reviews or do you do the same thing every month? It's, uh, it's every month and then uh, yearly. Okay, well, okay, big strategic yeah. review. Exactly. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, anybody else I'd love to scroll over here? Does this kind of work? Okay, all right. Um, and what are the success factors do you, do you think in that, are in that? What do you, is, is it, yeah, to make this cycle work and with the, with the previous illustrations? I think there's two things for me to fix this cycle. And so one is the traction and timing. Right. Which makes the whole thing flow and uh, you know, allows us to then keep the momentum and 
second group of three things. <laughs> they, um, they constantly do uh, health checks as well to, to improve, uh, ah, improve right. the SNO case. Okay. So you, that sounds like you're really fully committed. And any builds? I think the, the leadership engagement is important that, you know, our, our MD is always present in the review and, you know, right. he, he gives he gives feedback and he he gives his comments and view and, and things. Okay, so the strong sponsorship, strong leadership, it's seen as needed. It's seen as a way of driving the business, of bringing the different parts of the business together. So you're not just doing regional, you're actually also bringing it together across the whole whole group. Okay, this is, what I, this is what I prepared earlier as some of the other things to think about here is, and then we'll comment on that, is data. Data's come up in a couple of uh, sessions I've been in earlier today. Uh, so unless you've got a good data um, policy, data management, uh, you've, got, you've got the same standards mm -hmm. of data, whether it's region to region to region, so you, you're managing that right. So when we're, when we're pulling data up to support this process, uh, we've got a lot of confidence that we're not, uh, we've, got, we've got some uh, quality around the data. Yeah? Um, the standardization of the cycle came up with, yeah? So I agree with that. So it's, it's as much as possible. It doesn't need to be absolutely one size fits all, but as long as we do it in a, in a standardized way, and that cycle also is the really important thing because you're taking a snapshot and then, and then doing it, and you want to turn that around as fast as possible uh, because things change over time, obviously. Um, and the last thing I put in there was around organization, around leadership. Uh, one of the reasons why it doesn't, doesn't work is because there's a, there is a lack of that, so I'm pleased to, pleased to hear that. Okay, so. We've had a recap on, on sales and ops planning. Um, so on the complexity side, let me show this. So this is, take, this is a snapshot of a network. I'm not sure how, the numbers don't really matter, but they are, these are manufacturing sites on the left and markets on the right. Uh, and this is a snapshot of a real network. It, it's part of Europe. So if you look, you've got two plants in Germany, um, and Germany makes for the German market, but less than 50% for the German market in this case. But that's not unusual. So where do they source? So I don't think it's the complexity of the routings that's important here, or the volumes that's important here. What becomes more important is if if that complexity on products means that actually Germany has some sourcing which is global sourcing and, and local sourcing. That, that the products going through the German, German plants um, are, are, have got a lot of changes. So it's around change management in, in this. That you've got products with the different components that need to be sourced from different ways. So I've not shown the supply side of this, but it's, it's that, I think, is more important when it comes to complexity and being able to, to manage that than actually the volumes here. So you've got that mix of global, local products, promotions. So if you've got high promotions, um, which causes uh, instability or, or variation in demand, that is sometimes seen as, um, well, that's a, that's a deterrent from being able to do an effective sales and operations pro, uh, process. Well, again, I don't necessarily see that. I think it's all about having a forecast, but if, if the forecast is based on uh, best uh, information, uh, it's got your market insights, it's the best you can do, and each month you're reviewing it, so if it isn't, if it isn't absolutely right, get it right, and it's only enough to be able to do that, um, to be able to feed that information back into the supply chain so that you've got some stability um, around the supply being able to meet the demand. Okay. Uh, escalations, though, are uh, an unnecessary complexity. And what do I mean by escalations? 
So I mean that when customer orders and we've got the demand side, but in the week after that demand plan's being signed off by the uh, regional sales director, uh, on the ground though, there are uh, problems and issues surfacing because uh, a particular supermarket chain is escalating and saying, no, I want this tomorrow, I want this. And also, the customer orders going through the market units are going directly through to the manufacturing sites. Now, does that happen? Yeah. It may not happen in your businesses because you've got governance and control over uh, through your supply, uh, sales and operations planning process, but it, it, it can happen. Uh, and that introduces then instability. So rather than going from something that um, can adjust to change, but you're going outside of the assumptions and the boundaries, and that's where you can get that instability. Uh, and I've talked before about data management. Data can really sort of throw these things. So uh, one example from a previous company was the same SKU number, but one was um, food and the other one was wrapping tape. And it's, and, it's, and it's really having that, you need to have that confidence in that data so that when we're talking about SKU number XYZ, it, that it's the same thing everywhere, that you've got the, the comfort, that the standard is the same, so the dimensions of the box are length, width, depth. I've seen it where it's, it's somebody's decided, oh no, we're not gonna do it this, that way, we're gonna do it this way, so it's, it's uh, length, depth, width. That can re and that can really throw things. So you can throw things from a logistics point of view, but from a sales and operations planning, are we talking about the same skew? And the last thing on there are, are the cultural changes where um, for all the right reasons, people can get really attached to a particular region or a particular brand, um, and, and all, all the uh, efforts and uh, process application is around protecting that, rather than uh, out with uh, and across the, the company. On that last point, is, that, uh, is there anything from those that you've, you, you, where you're applying um, sales and ops planning? Is, is that a kind of uh, critical success factor? Is that something you've seen? Or do you have your processes and your frameworks and your rules and your roles so uh, spelt out that actually it isn't an issue because everybody knows what they're doing and they know that I'm doing this, but uh, somebody in my role in another part of the company will be doing very similar, a similar thing. Yeah, I mean, we, um, so we have like uh, central governance who are responsible to make sure that we're all operating in the same way. Right. And, you know, with those roles and responsibilities and timings and tools. Um, so, and that's part of the health checking process. Right. That if anybody's straight offline, and it does happen, that we can come back to what the standard was. Right, okay. And is, and is, that, out, out, is that part of your management of your sales and operations planning process or just slightly to one side like an opera operational excellence or a sales and operational excellence kind of governance yeah. governance risk well uh, i mean uh, it's new for us i mean right. within the last 10 years so it's the team that implemented it so i can't oh, say right. that they're anything specific <laughs> okay. just the, the team that implemented is still you know auditing the process ongoing okay okay yeah. any other any other uh, experiences on, on that from anybody? Oh. Okay, so um, the last bit, transformation, continuous improvement. How do you decide whether or not, well, this is a big transformation program or continuous improvement? And I think from, from listening to a couple of you here, it sounds like if you, if you have, oops, sorry, right, if you have strategy, well-defined, might be regional, but it's also business, processes well-defined with rules, with roles associated with them. Um, you've probably got uh, IT and tools associated with this. Uh, the data's right. The organization is well-defined and fits. 
uh, the culture, everybody knows, yeah, I'm working for this part of the business, but actually I'm all, I am part of this bigger business that's going, going places because that's where my future lies and that's where we're going. We want to grow. We want to be successful. Uh, and also, uh, we've got well-defined performance KPIs. Not to hit people over the head with, but actually to manage, to measure, and to identify where we could improve. Now, uh, the triangles in there are around, and you'll, probably, you'll have two. So this is, this is an illustration of a maturity chart. So you want to do a, a, a maturity chart that says, how are we doing in each of these areas now, but where do we want to be? Uh, and what I found is, if you have more than one area where you're going to significantly change, you're talking transformation. But you could also use this as a framework to say, well, how are we doing and are we actually, are we actually keeping on top of things? Are we actually improving? Have we got our systems, whether it's people, process, technology, with also that culture and behavior wrapper around it, are they, are they right and fit for purpose? Because after transformation, you then need to get into continuous improvement. If we were talking about transformation, you'd be talking something like this. It, it can be massive. So each of those little colored boxes with a number on is a change project. And it needs to be managed like a program. And this is an illustration of, of one. So there's a big difference between actually doing this and actually you've got things in place and keeping it going. So, summarize. Sales and ops planning, I think it's carried out even if it's not formalized, but I'm, I'm pleased that I've heard good reports from here that it's in place. And in order to have it formalized, um, that you've got frameworks in place. You've got things that are, well, that are defined so everybody knows what they're doing. Sounds like, uh, particularly at, at executive level, it's, it's actually recognized as being really important for the, for the business in order to drive the annual operating plan, but also to drive the strategy. That some standardization is needed. This is the one thing that usually causes kind of issues because people want to do things their own way. I'm in Germany, I want to do it this way. I'm in Poland, I want to do it this way. So that's why the leadership and the cascade down is so important. Um, and the recognition that ways of working and an interdependency and change management, ongoing basis, is really key. So challenge complexity, use it to do that, simpler, faster, better, uh, and use that transformation to do continuous improvement. So last slide, I've put the definition up there again. Any other, any other questions? I've, I've gone one minute over what I said I would do. But uh, helpful. Uh, each of these slides, I'm sure, uh, each of these slides will be available afterwards, will, won't they? Will they? Uh, they might be, yeah. They might? Okay, okay. All right. Well, if, if anybody wants them. Right, okay. Okay, perfect, okay. So each of these slides has got notes behind it. I've not kept the notes because I, I've kind of had libby, libby because of uh, you guys here. But I hope you find that useful. Thanks for turning up. Uh, enjoy your evening. It's been a long day, so kind of relax. Go for it. <laughs> and thanks very much. Thank you, David. <laughs>